I think it's about time to introduce our speaker who just walked across. <laughs> So this is Tim. Uh, Tim Cochran has actually been part of ThoughtWorks for 13 years, uh, which is actually a very long time. He's been a dev, an architect, a solutions architect, platform, like whatever it is, he's probably done. Uh, for the past couple years, he's been our market tech principal uh, out of New York. So he pretty much leads up a lot of the technical bits um, out of the New York office. So we thank him for that. Um, he's been an integral part in a lot of our big, large distributed clients and really shaping the way um, QA, uh, architecture, you name it, he's probably done it. So this is really great person to have in our company. Um, I have one funny note about him. You're going to hear this soon, but uh, he's British. And one thing uh, about working with Tim for as long as I have is that I would actually say the same thing that he does and get blank looks. They'd be like, yeah, all right, what is this Cassie girl saying? He would say the exact same thing, and everyone would be like, yeah, that's a great idea, Tim. And I really actually blame it on his British accent. So you can tell me afterwards if that's true. Okay? So without further ado, Tim Cochran. This beer. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Welcome. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, <coughs> quality assurance with uh, continuous delivery. So I think the uh, important part to emphasize is the continuous delivery part <coughs> um, because I'm going to be talking about a few sort of practices that are maybe potentially a little kind of uh, extreme or radical, perhaps. Um, and you know that, that this is because we've we've seen the companies that are doing continuous delivery adopt these practices, right? However, uh, if you're not trying to do continuous delivery, um, then you don't need to do all the practices I'm talking about. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, don't get too scared, all right? So um, right, let's just do a sort of a poll here. So uh, who are developers? All right. Oh, okay. Who are QA tester types? All right. So who's sort of post technical manager type? All right. We need you to leave. I'm just <laughs> just kidding. It's, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm <laughs> unfortunately I, I sometimes fall into that bucket as well. So, uh, so it's not. Um, so who's doing CI continuous integration? All right. Cool. Yeah. Work out percentage there. I think it's about fifty percent. Yeah, maybe. CD. That's a bit lower, maybe five, two percent. Uh, um, all right. Uh, who uses uh, visible build radiators? All right. Give me one second here. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> this field rate radiator sort of looks like this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, actually. It's kind of a misdemeanor. If you have a build radiator, maybe it doesn't look like this. Because if, if you're willing to show your build in a prominent place, you probably don't want to be advertising <laughs> this too much. Um, but, but quite often, so, so this is just like a, a way of showing it. But quite often, we do walk into uh, an organization and sort of the, the state of uh, the state of the build looks like this. Uh, I'm going to have to, sorry, I'm going to have to get my notes here. It's all going wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about some of the symptoms that we, we often see. Because um, uh, we see a lot of companies that are actually uh, spending a lot of money, they're, they're uh, moving to automated QA, but we see them perhaps not getting the uh, amount of value that they, they should be. Right? So what are the kind of the symptoms that we see? Um, Long-running tests. 
Um, maybe you can just nod if you see this. Yeah, some nods. All right. So uh, long, long running tests. Um, you know, so uh, I've seen test suites. I mean, an hour is quite typical, right? Um, four hours. Uh, I don't think actually uh, I've seen uh, like a, a test suite that ran in two days. I think even Fortworks wrote a test suite that ran in two days at one point, um, and we had to build like a cluster Selenium to fix that. Um, Flaky tests, so they, they run lots of nods. They run uh, sort of uh, you know, one in three, one in ten, sort of fail, that kind of stuff. Uh, deploying, so even though the pipeline is built, is red, we still deploy. Yeah. Common sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, environments that don't reflect, reflect prop. So even if I have my automated test running, I don't have the assurance that I need because they don't actually reflect production, some nods, uh, and then quite often it's just environments just don't work, or that when I go to an environment I have to do a lot of a lot of work to it to be able to either manually test or uh, run automated tests uh, on it. Uh, so that, those are kind of some of the symptoms that we see. So, so in summary, uh, we see uh, companies spending a huge amount of investments into automated testing, but um, productivity is not necessarily improved, um, quality is not improved, and the user happiness, user satisfaction uh, has not improved. Right? So, uh, okay, so I'm now going to talk a little bit about why is, um, so this is a theoretical situation. Right? It's, just, it's just a, uh, this is a placeholder for uh, some functionality that you want to test. In this situation, it's a modal that's been displayed. So we're going to talk about why, why, why is it difficult to write a good uh, browser-based test. Right? So uh, some of the, there's many different reasons, right? So some of the reasons are maybe there's an animation that runs to display the modal. Uh, maybe there's some AJAX running to pre-fill, or when I, when I save it and then to refresh the page, there's some AJAX running. Um, Maybe the, uh, the server is under load, um, or, or maybe even the, the browser itself, the client, is, is under load. So I, I, they, they run at different speeds. I can't guarantee how, how fast or slow they run. Um, quite often, um, if, I'm, if I'm writing an automated test, usually it's automation runs a lot faster than a user will ever run. Will ever, will ever do, right? So if you're using a headless browser, you're going to be doing operations that happen in split seconds. Um, a user will never click that fast, but you're going to have to deal with situations that occur uh, because you want to run it that fast. And we do want to run it fast, right? Because we want to get the fast feedback. But I'm effectively writing my test for a situation that actually won't happen because a user can't physically click, you know, uh, faster than 100 milliseconds or something like that. So that's kind of an interesting Thing about writing automated tests. Um, it, to get to this point, um, I may have have to have gone through like five pages, um, and, and those, you know, may, maybe I do that over and over again for each test. Um, quite often, the, the data is very, very difficult to set up, right? So to actually get to this situation, um, I have, would have have to rely on certain data being in the, in the database, or have to build a lot of like uh, scripts and automation. Um, Anyway, I think you're kind of getting the picture. Um, and I guess it's also quite difficult to write, right? Because the feedback cycle is quite slow, right? If I, if I um, in a unit test, I get the feedback in a, a few milliseconds, right? But when I'm running Selenium tests, uh, it might take uh, a lot longer. So they're actually quite expensive to write. Um, so I guess this is my point, right? So, so browser-based testing is, is hard and expensive, right? Um, so, so this is, was my subtitle. Uh, I'm not telling you not, I, I'm, I'm saying we, we should, uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't write them, I'm just saying you shouldn't completely rely on them. So, we, and we're going to talk about when the right situation is to rely on them and I'm going to talk about some, uh, some techniques to uh, rely on them less, essentially. Um, to, what, what could we replace them with? Right. Okay, uh, is this familiar to anyone? All right, okay. So uh, if you're in the business of writing automated tests, this is very important. Um, it's an article 
written by, uh, oh, it's not, I think it came up with somebody else, but as Martin Fowler likes to do, he uh, put it on his blog and, um, and it made it popular. Uh, so um, the idea here is that <clears throat> what we're saying is that tests on, on the bottom of the pyramid are lower, uh, uh, are obviously lower, they're quicker to, they're quicker to run <clears throat> and they're cheaper to write. Um, tests at the top are uh, slower to run and more expensive to write. So what we're sort of saying is that when you look at your test suite, you should you should sort of see this, right? You should sort of you have like lots of unit tests, some service tests, and very few UI tests. Right? So that that is what we're aiming for. Um, but often when we go into organisations, it sort of looks a bit more like that, right? Like uh, <laughs> and this is not a pyramid. <laughs> this is a uh, uh, an ice cream cone. Uh, so <laughs> is this familiar? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is what we see quite often. Um, so this is, yeah. Um, and this is another thing that we often see. I, I don't know what to call this, maybe uh, a bow tie or something. Um, but, so this is quite often, this is actually very common when you have um, kind of like a developer and a QA department very separated, right? So you have all the developers are writing unit tests, all the QAs are writing sort of long running uh, browser tests and nothing really happens in the middle. Um, that's, that's quite common. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the, uh, the pyramid here. So, so really what we want is um, at the bottom, uh, we, wanna, we, you know, we want this to run fast. Um, if, you if you completely remove I.O., then you can get it running in seconds. Right? So this is what, what we want at the bottom. I, want, I really, as a developer, if I'm going to do TDD, and I'm going to do TDD well, I need uh, fast feedback. Right? If you really want to get into the, the zone of, of writing uh, test-first development, um, then you need that, that fast feedback. Even when you're, you're reaching sort of 10 seconds, uh, that, that's, you're going to get it out of the zone, and you're going to get out of some of the benefits of TDD. So this is our ideal situation. Uh, I'm not saying that other situations wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily work, but this is our ideal situation. So no I/O. So that means no talking to the file system, no talking to uh, network network layer, um, and we're testing units, um, and you can have thousands, and they can run in seconds. So uh, the service layer. Uh, what I, what I like to do is to split it into two pieces. Um, one is I like to say in process, and one is out of process. Right. So this this is quite. There's actually quite a lot of research going on at the moment um, with the in process stuff. So there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> uh, a lot of tools that are uh, trying to sort of move away from Selenium and to actually uh, create uh, tests that that can run um, in with with some I/O, but with limited I/O. So you don't. You know, quite often you can do a lot of. Um, testing without going through the browser or without going through the, the, the network layer. So um, there's a great talk from uh, an export worker called Nat Price, and I think it's called How to How to Have Your Cake and Eat It or something like that, but it's about how, how to run a functional test suite in yeah, like a minute. Um, and he essentially uses this concept, right, where um, functional tests are written in process, right? So I can, I can test at my domain layer or my controller layer um, but it's, it's written in the same uh, uh, process and it, it will run really, really quickly because, again, we're limiting the amount of I.O. that's happening. Um, and there could pr probably be a whole talk about that uh, that we should do sometime, but this is a fairly broad talk. Um, of course, right, so, so that, that's going to be the majority of my, that be, might be where my, my BDD tests run, I'm testing my business logic, um, but at, at some point I need to make sure I've wired up correctly to my, um, uh, network interface or my browser. So I do need, I do need some sort of API test running here. Um, and then at the end, uh, really a few browser-based tests. And really what I'm doing is I'm uh, assuming that the components that I'm testing, I'm assuming the APIs individually are tested. Um, and I'm really testing the integration between them. Right. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to talk some more about this. Generally, we don't recommend writing um, tests for stories. We don't recommend writing tests for acceptance criteria. Um, usually, we tend to base it on flows. So user flows through the system. Um, so uh, that's what we recommend. Um, and 
ideally, again, so I think sort of five to ten minutes, so we're sort of looking at, um, we're sort of looking at about ten minutes, right? So I should be able to run all my tests, um, you know, to make sure that my uh, feature is uh, deployable, right? That's the whole idea of con continuous delivery, that we want, we want every commit to be in a potentially deployable state, right? And I do that by uh, automated tests. So, that, so that's the goal, right? But I, I ideally would want that in uh, 10, 10 minutes. And you know, as I say, this is based on uh, uh, Fortworks experience and the companies that are doing continuous delivery well, in our opinion. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, so I have said that we're gonna have a few here. I, I just wanna talk about a little bit about what, what would be a good uh, browser-based test. Even though I'm saying don't rely on them, I, I do think it's worth uh, pointing out how a good one is. So I already talked about that. Tests of flow uh, works in all environments. So this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, quite often um, in, in an idle situation, we, we want them to work in production. Um, we want them to work on my developer, developer environment. Um, very often uh, we find that the automated tests are tied to an environment. They only run on the QA environment, for example. Ideally, for the most value, we want them uh, available in all environments. Um, I appreciate there are some situations where you can't test it in production, um, but the goal should be to, to run it in all of them. Uh, use of standard libraries, so don't try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, I've been to so many clients where they've just recreated some sort of BDD library or something, yeah, cause problems. Uh, yes, as I said, right, so it should be uh, run before check-in. Um, I think this is the big smell. If, if you, if your developers are not running it before they check in, you can, the feedback cycle just goes goes giant, um, and you yeah you end up with a lot of problems. Um, <clears throat> deterministic, that's what we already talked about. Um, yeah, it manages its own data dependencies, so we're not relying on an ETL or something running, um, or like a particular product or something being in the database. Um, um, and then this is the very important thing, um, which I should have highlighted a bit more, which is the value is continually reviewed. Right? So actually, what we talk about in Fullworks is pushing down the pyramid. Right? So maybe you might start off with a few tests, but as your application grows and you create more services, um, and I see a smell, right? I see my test suite is creeping up to 20 minutes or whatever, what I really want to do is push down the pyramid. So I'm looking at the, uh, the test, and I'm working, I'm working with my developers, and I'm saying, you know, how could we test that at, at a different layer? Right? So that, that's what we say is pushing down the pyramid. And this is, this is a very important thing that's, that's continually reviewed uh, the value of it. Okay, uh, so this, I just wanted to point out, um, anybody read the tech radar? Yeah, okay, great. A few people, the armed workers. Um, so uh, we get, um, I think we can explain what this is later, but it, it's essentially our opinion of stuff. Um, but so this is kind of a pattern that we, we put up uh, on there recently. It's kind of like CI theater, uh, where you know it's kind of like a lot of companies and managers sort of want to say they're doing CI, but they're, they're not really. Uh, so some examples of that might be um, sort of running against uh, a mainline, running against master, but not allowing many check-ins to that. Um, so your, your integration isn't really continuous. Um, Running uh, a build with poor test coverage, um, and you know, so the, the test coverage it doesn't really reflect anything useful. Um, so that that's common. Um, and then running a CI against feature branches, uh, which results in what we're describing as continuous isolation. <laughs> Just an interesting term. I didn't come up with that. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> yeah, so we want the CI server to uh, build the project, run comprehensive tests to ensure the whole software system is integrated and is an always releasable state um, and then satisfying the prerequisite of continuous delivery. All right, so this is what we want. All right, so yeah, let's talk about that. Um, decoupled architecture, so I mean, I, I kind of threw out some numbers at you um, and so when you have a small application, it's very e sort of easy to achieve, um, but at a certain point, you're, you're gonna grow um, and you know, like if you take like an e-commerce website or something, quite often there's, the, there's a very uh, large system at the core of, of the company. Um, and what we recommend is to actually uh, 
there's actually a number of different benefits, but uh, one of the other benef benefits is to be able to reduce the, the test suite here. Um, it's to actually decouple the architecture, um, and um, each each of these uh, parts of the system um, is is autonomous. It can be deployed uh, separately, and each one is tested in its own right. So each one uh, would adhere to the to the, um, the 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 test pyramid. And essentially, what I'm doing at like an enterprise level is all I'm really doing is checking that these things can talk to each other. Um, and actually, if I'm designing my architecture correctly, there isn't many places where they talk to each other. Um, so, so it's kind of an interesting way, and there's lots of other benefits from this kind of architecture, like um, resilience, um, autonomy, those kind of things. And it's kind of an interesting, like a way that you could think about it, um, a, way, a way that you could think about it is, uh, how might you test an integration point? Right, so how do you test uh, Facebook, Facebook API, right? Do I retest all of Facebook's functionality? No, I just assume that I can talk to it. So sort of at an enterprise level, you can always think of it like that, right? So all I'm really doing is, uh, you know, you can think of everything almost as like external integration points where I'm, I'm just, I'm checking that I can talk to it. Um, and then I do have to, you know, if I'm designing in a decoupled architecture, I do have to have the concern of what happens when, it, when it's down. Um, but that, that's part of designing your architecture correctly. Um, what I want to point out is I'm not, uh, this is not an advert for microservices. Um, this is an advert for a decoupled architecture, which can be done in a monolith. So you can have uh, modules and components that are decoupled, that have APIs between them. There doesn't have to be network boundaries there. So I just wanted to point that out, right? Um, and we, there are many companies like uh, Facebook, like Etsy, that run uh, a monolith and deploy to production many times a day. So um, it's not, that's actually something that we see quite common, is that people are introducing microservices to achieve continuous delivery, but you don't have to. Uh, so. um, and I should also point out that um, the, <laughs> this is one way to solve the, the long test run problem. The other way is to throw infrastructure and smart stuff at it, right? So you build a, a very, uh, a big cluster of, um, yeah, if you if you really want to run a lot of tests really quickly, you have to build a lot of infrastructure and cluster, and people do that. Um, but I think this is easier, personally. Um, okay, he just talked about all of that. Uh, so well-defined APIs. Um, so okay, you kind of like, I feel like sometimes the QA department starts, just doesn't trust anyone. They just start with the expectation that whatever software they're getting is gonna be broken. Um, so you kind of, you kind of wanna like, if you're going to have that attitude, um, I think that you're <laughs> you're always going to fail, right? So let, let's start. I think you should start with the expectation that the components, if you've got a decoupled architecture, that the components are well tested. Um, uh, so you test that the components can communicate, okay, um, and there's some techniques for doing this. Um, I'm not going to explain it in this talk, but go and read about it. Uh, so there's different forms of, of contract testing. Uh, there's this idea called consumer-driven contracts. I think you're also going to look at versioning, about um, yeah, well, that kind of thing. So, um, but it, it's it's important. Um, obviously, REST APIs and semantic versioning is all sorts of important kind of things. All right. Uh, so, just to briefly talk about the component test. Uh, we, I wanted to sort of point out that you know some of the practices that we do now. Um, there's a lot of the companies are kind of um, you know browser technology has improved, right? So when we wrote when Fortworks wrote Selenium 11 years ago, um, it was supporting IE6, right? So, na so now, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of companies that are basically not supporting some of these old browsers. And that, that does mean that you don't have to do so much of the, the same level of testing. Um, the other thing that's interesting that's happening, um, uh, it says web fragment, probably should say web app, but um, is that some of the technology that you're introducing gives you a decoupled architecture for free, right? So if, I, if I'm introducing Angular or React, the whole point of it is to, to, to work off uh, uh, an API, right? So I've got a decoupled architecture, right? I'm no, not, not tying, I don't have like jQuery soup or something, right? I'm, uh, I have, a, yeah, I have a, a decoupled architecture. So what I can actually do in my React or Angular app is I can actually write functional tests that test a lot of the flow within that application. And I can assume that this thing is pretty well tested. 
The same applies to Android and mobile apps and uh, Alexa skills and chatbots and conversational UIs and whatever omnichannel craziness we're going to do. Um, and then down here, your, uh, this is where your business logic and your APIs are going to sit. Um, you know, we sort of talked earlier about uh, in-process tests. Um, I think it's something you might do with the database. It's always a bit difficult, but you could swap to like an in-memory database or something like that and sort of test it over here. You can put a stub in. Um, so, so review of the. <laughs> so, so what is the uh, what is the goal of quality assurance? Um, so, you know, the, the goal is to. I guess, in my mind, it's, it's sort of to reduce risk. It's to reduce the risk of likelihood of costing the company money. It's to reduce the risk of affecting our user happiness, user satisfaction, right? Um, so what, what are some of the other ways to reduce risk? So, right. so I'm going to pause for a second. Uh, so that was the first half of my talk. Um, I wanted to pause now for some questions um, before we get into um, techniques that aren't automated testing. Do you have any questions about the first part of the talk? Uh, the guy at the back of the hat. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, in your view, parallel doing throwing infra at running tests is yes. harder than re-architecting or decoupling an architecture. My personal experience is that changing anything about the architecture of an app is amongst the hardest and most error prone things you can possibly do. So why in your experience is more infra so difficult? Or expensive for that? Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously the answer is, is not as simple as I said, right? It, it depends. Um, and yeah, as you said, right, like, it kind of depends where you're at, right? Especially with a, um, the, with a legacy app application um, where it's, it's very difficult to, it, it kind of depends how, how, how difficult is it to break up that monolith into, into microservices. Um, and you know, there's a whole talk we have about techniques to do that. Um, but you're probably right. Um, there, there's a there's a spectrum. Um, uh, obviously, for Greenfield, uh, you know, the recommendation is to sort of to decouple from the beginning. Um, but uh, I think the answer is it it, it depends. Um, sorry, I know that was a, like a non-answer. But um, <laughs> any other questions? Uh, so you mentioned the automated testing. Uh, you said value is continuous review. Like, yeah. Can you elaborate a little more? Can you yeah, so, uh, yeah, let me go back. Yeah, so, so say you, you, you're starting off a product and I have a few features, I just throw a bunch of surname tests on it and I get some regret, some good regression. Um, but at a certain point, so I've got, you know, maybe I'm starting with a bit of an ice cream cone or whatever, um, but at, at a certain point, um, there's a smell, right? There's a smell that um, maybe it's too difficult to write the test. Maybe the smell is that uh, takes too long. Uh, and so some of the other things you're going to look at is like, am I actually testing business logic in my test, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're testing business logic in your test, you probably ask yourself, could I do that at an API level, right? Because um, like really, the user interface is, is just a way of calling the business logic that, that the API provides. Um, so, so I think, um, so what I would, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, I think what you would use is like, what's the slowest test, right? And I'd start there. It's like, what's the test that causes the most pain for all our developers? What's the most complicated, complex test? Uh, that's where I'd start. And, you know, I, if you're doing Agile and you're uh, applying continuous improvement where every iteration I'm spending some money on tech debt, uh, part of your tech debt is your test suite, right? And the amount of time that, it, the time that you're pausing waiting for your CI to run, right? So, so you continually look and say, can I, can I move it down? Can I push it down into a, an API test? Uh, maybe I could I could look and see could I push it into like an in process sort of domain test. Um, this it it does sometimes it this is where it gets a little funny where um, and we're going to talk about that later is obviously this is difficult to do if you if you're a um, a QA that's uh, separated from the developers right um, you know a lot of what I'm talking about 
re uh, requires collaboration with the way that you uh, design and architect your system and the way that you design and architect your tests, right? I think that's, that's I'm giving you the rest of the talk now, but that, that's kind of like the most important thing, one of the most. Did I answer your question? Yeah, okay. All right, one more, and then we'll move on. So uh, you showed the image of the hourglass looking yeah. uh, as a pyramid yeah. as well, um, and you said that that's a symptom of uh, devs and QA being yeah. uh, siloed. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think are some techniques to uh, break down those barriers? Um, <clears throat> That, I think I'm going to answer that in the second half of my talk. Okay. Um, I think. If I don't, ask me again at the end. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, let's go. Okay. Um, so other ways to uh, reduce risk. Okay. Um, so, uh, so Fortworks loves automated testing, perhaps sometimes a bit too much, actually. Um, it's definitely the tool that we we get to quite a lot, um, and some you know, um, and we've actually when we visited some of the companies, the uh, and it, it it does so it does reduce the risk, right? Uh, but we've had, we visited some of the companies that do CD, and perhaps they actually rely a little less than we expected them uh, on automated testing, and they use some other techniques. Um, so a lot of the techniques about reducing risk are in this book. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to describe these um, because you can buy the book and you can read it. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is a lot, of, a lot of these kind of things about you know blue green deployments. So I have no downtime. Um, doing canary releases where I'm, I'm uh, rolling out my version. Um, really, what I'm doing is it's, it's kind of the same goal, right? I'm reducing the likelihood of uh, company my uh, costing. Uh, costing my, my company money. Um, targeted releases, um, feature toggles are similar things, sort of A-B tests and experiments. Uh, continually improving your process. Um, you know, all these kind of things, like using KPIs, applying database migrations, all of these kind of things are going to uh, help you reduce the risk. Um, I would recommend you read this book um, and there is a great thing in the middle of it called the continuous delivery maturity model. Um, you know, it wasn't like, I guess why I'm, why I'm kind of harping on this is because I, I guess I go to a lot of clients and they kind of pick and choose. You know, they do a bit here or there. Um, but like, all these things kind of go hand in hand. So, I mean, the first way to reduce risk is to, you know, follow the continuous delivery practices and um, say, I'm not, going to go over this. There's a lot of information in that book and, and follow those practices. Um, and that will allow you to reduce risk and, and potentially re allow you to actually stop relying on your end-to-end -end tests so much. Um, but we're going to talk about some of that stuff. Um, so this is it's kind of like, I'm going to make some connections that perhaps we don't normally make or we're not empowered to make those connections. Right? So if you think about the, the time that it takes, that quality assurance takes, um, I'm going to say that reduces productivity. Right? I'm going to say that, that costs the company money. If I'm reducing productivity, I'm um, uh, costing the company money. Um, <clears throat> now, the time that a production bug is affecting users, um, if I can reduce that, okay, if I get a bug out there and you know it's maybe my Maybe checkout is down in a disaster, or my social feeds are down or something. Um, the time that I can, uh, the, the, if I can reduce the amount of time to fix that, then I'm, I'm going to save the company money. Right? So I guess my point here is, um, and it's, it's kind of like, it's very, it's an odd thing to look at, um, but as a CTO or somebody, you sort of have this choice, right? I could spend a lot of, I could spend a lot of time uh, putting a very, very uh, sophisticated regression suite together, um, or I could not. I could just accept that occasionally I'm going to screw up. Um, you know, I think you would have to be careful. Uh, there might be parts of the application where this this question changes, but but occasionally I'm I'm going to screw up. But 
I, I know that I can fix it in five minutes, right? And if, if I know that I can fix it in five minutes, then um, maybe I don't need so much regression. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the problem with this kind of like this kind of uh, linking these two things together is uh, who's actually in the position to link these things? Um, it's quite often um, the way that companies are set up with, as, as we talked about earlier, right? With with uh, sort of uh, you know infrastructure and developers being separated from QA. Neither of them look at it like this, right? So quite often the uh, a, a tester maybe they're they're adding uh, you know they're, they're adding another test that takes 30 seconds, um, but. Perhaps they don't care because um, you know it's, it's not their job to to write code, so they, so they don't they're not feeling the pain that the, uh, the developers or so. It's, it's how do you, how do you kind of link these link these two things together? And it's uh, and what who does that in a company? That's that's a, a tricky question. Um, but I, I think your VPE or CTO should be making these kind of decisions, and it should be a conscious choice of um, how much where do I want to spend my money. Um, so let's, let's talk about the uh, how else to reduce risk. So uh, we talked about Canary a little bit. Um, so this is kind of, again, very popular with, with sort of a Facebook type thing. So um, so companies that are doing uh, continuous delivery, they very rarely, they never do this. They never uh, do a release that goes out to 100% of users, um, pretty much. Um, what they do is they, they separate uh, deployments and releases, right? So I, I deploy my change. Um, probably it's just going to be down here. It would be maybe, uh, maybe only I, I could see it. And I'm going to do a bit of testing. And then once I've, um, once I'm happy uh, with that sort of testing, I then, um, I then uh, release it um, to uh, more users and more users and more users. Um, and, and that that continuous that pipeline that change is, is often a different pipeline to uh, the uh, making the change in the first place. Um, so it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, I think the interesting stat with this is um, with Facebook. If you look at ten percent of users, I think that's like the country of New Zealand. <laughs> so and they do do that actually. They test New Zealand is like that's the country they use to test features for US because it's kind of like the US. But nobody cares about New Zealand, so they won't generate any <laughs> negative press. So they're like, let's put some features out, see what happens, and then, then we'll roll it out to the US. Which, I guess that kind of works. Um, <laughs> so, but at a smaller scale, you can sort of do the same thing. So they reduce the risk, right? They reduce the risk of causing this massive press problem in, in, you know, in the US by testing it in New Zealand first, where nobody cares what they do. Um, so this is... You know, so again, it's like, so how do I reduce the risk, right? So if I have a smaller a change, if I'm de deploying a smaller change, um, if I can actually review my code and I can see it, um, and I can reason about it, so it's sort of like, if, if you're over here, like I'm a hundred lines of code, I'm reasonably <laughs> sure that it's probably, my impact is probably gonna be within a certain area, right? And maybe a, a thousand lines, I'm kind of sure, but once I get over here, I have no idea, right? Probably at this point, I, I have to I have to retest everything, right? Because I have no idea, um, you know, anything could have changed, right? Like it, you can almost guarantee that something could have changed. Is that the amount of like code that you change? Yes. So this is the uh, when I deploy uh, the amount, yes, yeah, so the amount of lines that are the new or old or uh, are modified. And we're sort of saying there's different kind of like um, continuous delivery techniques. I'm going to say the controversial statement here that you know if you're doing trunk-based development, your 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 risk is is your you're going to reduce the risk a little bit. Uh, as we already talked about feature branches earlier, that it does mean that you're potentially um, not integrating as much, um, and then it goes up. The numbers are completely almost made up, um, but you you sort of get the idea. Um, similarly, uh, perhaps with the size of the application, right? So this is kind of. This is why a lot of companies will choose something like um, uh, like microservices. Um, so uh, if you can, you know, if I can, like over here, like the kind of nano services where my microservice is a thousand lines, um, I'm pretty much sure, like, when I make a change to it, I I know, uh, yeah, I know that my change is going to be very isolated and the amount of testing I need to do. 
Um, again, when you get back up here, and I'm at these kind of like 10 million line kind of code, and I'm changing like shun shared shared library that yeah, God knows what's going to happen. So you need a ton of a ton of regression uh, with, the, with the size of your application. Uh, this is one way. Okay, so that's what that's sort of one way, uh, three ways to well to visualize the reducing the risk, right? So it's uh, so it's just, uh, Less users, less less impact, uh, smaller change, um, smaller applications. Ways of, uh, I'm not saying you have to do all of those. Okay, so um, the other thing that's quite common, uh, I think again another blog entry on Martin Fowler's website is, um, sort of companies are kind of like giving up trying to create a production-like environment, especially as you're moving to like sort of SaaS services. You know, there's is, is, is a lot of stuff that isn't running, that's not within your control. So you're going to have to deal with, you're going to have to design your applications that they could go down. If something's not in your control, you sort of have to design it that they could go down at any point in time, right? So the value of some of those lower environments, where you, you kind of think that if I test it in this environment and it's, I make it as production like as, as possible, that nothing could go wrong in prod, whether well, that, that's not. True, right? So quite. Um, so a lot of uh, companies are, are kind of adopting this kind of uh, testing in production idea, where the the tests that you're writing are more like monitoring. So you, you can almost think about uh, maybe you, there's some smoke tests. Um, uh, quite often, when you deploy something, you have a smoke test, right? That makes every, make sure that everything works. Well, why don't you run that smoke test every minute, right? Um, those, those kind of things. Um, so a synthetic transaction. Uh, would basically be something that's as close to the uh, the operation uh, that the user is doing, right? Um, it can be an AP, it can be an API sort of uh, we call it an API journey where you're calling a bunch of APIs, or it could actually it could literally be a Selenium test. Um, I think the interesting thing here is check out. Um, it's kind of like what's the one thing that would get you fired if you break? It's probably check out. And what's the one thing companies don't really test because it's too difficult? Is is check out. Um, but there's ways of testing it. It just means that you have to, um, you know, I've been at companies where, yeah, they, if they do a change, they charge a dollar to everybody's credit card because that's that's the only way I can be sure that it's it's gonna uh, actually test. Uh, so uh, useful monitoring. Um, so I think. Uh, so some of the. the you know, this is when we talk about monitoring. It's not really um, CPU usage. It's not uh, memory. It's not pinging. It's, it's again. It's very close to what I was saying earlier. It's getting close, to, closer. Those things are useful to monitor, um, but but also monitoring things like business metrics, right? So what happens if what happens if I um, accidentally change a CSS that my checkout button is covered up, right? All, all most of this monitoring will be fine, um, but my uh, suddenly. My business transactions just went down, right? What, so it's, it's kind of like you really have to sort of monitor, uh, like try and get uh, useful monitoring that, that means something. Um, avoid broken windows. Um, yeah, these all these companies. I've been at places that say that the operations don't even look at an error until it's like above, like five percent of all five hundreds or something like that. Um, but I, th I think the more successful companies they treat logging and metrics as uh, they as something that is uh, that needs to be kept sort of pristine, right? They, if there's a log entry or a metric, it it, me it can only be there if it's meaningful to people, right? So, if there are, you know, how many times where you 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 get an error and then some developer says, "Oh, don't worry about that," right? But that that causes a problem. That that now that means who can support this system? The only person who can support the piece of the system is that you, that developer that knows that that to ignore that error. Right, so if you if you actually get rid of of your broken windows, uh, this applies to tests as well. But but if you if failing tests, and, but if you if you can create a, a kind of clean system, um, it allows a lot more opportunity and a lot um, less reliance on uh, people's knowledge. Again, right. um, this is sort of a, a continuous delivery infrastructure as code uh, practice. So this is something that uh, we see. Um, so we very often one of the big bottlenecks in a company is the environments. They really struggle to keep it uh, the, the data in sync, uh, services up, 
you know, to keep it, they're often, you know, the term snowflake, so like a special snowflake that, you know, I've been mean, at companies that have like 50 different production-like environments, but they're all completely, different. each one is different. Um, so um, this is kind of an interesting thing here. So we say configuration changes should be applied automatically, and this is one of the tenants of infrastructure as code. Um, and why is that, right? It's, it's because to make the changes, uh, to, to, you know, if I change my um, configuration, I want to apply that change to all environments. But the, the, other, the other reason why you do that is I want to wipe out any change that, I've, that someone has manually done. Because right? that's, that's the, what we talk about with configuration drift. That's what, what ruins your environments, is, is manually going in and changing them. So applying it automatically uh, is very important. Um, yeah, populated with production-like environment. Um, scenarios, easy to read. I've written east, but that should be say easy. Um, yeah, so um, this is quite common um, with the companies that are doing CD. They sort of just have a production environment and development environment. That's pretty extreme. Um, but it, it, it actually, um, I'm not saying that um, everybody can do that, um, but it, it, it is, uh, it, yeah, there's, there's companies that are deploying many times a day um, will have very few. And if they, if they do, the difference, the delta, so quite often like, there might be a staging environment, but the delta between that staging environment and that production, and the production environment um, may only be sort of like, May only exist for like 20 minutes while I while I change my when I apply my new patches. Um, we we're getting off topic a little bit. Okay. All right. So this is kind of the more uh, important but also really difficult thing to solve, and it's going to answer some of the questions hopefully. So um, I think the most important thing about how to uh, ensure quality um, is actually uh, cultural changes. Um, so. This is actually one of the very common thing is that the products lack quality uh, because the people that are building them don't care about the product. Um, it's kind of like this, this sad thing, but you know if you if you care about the product, um, you will naturally write uh, a more high quality code and more you'll you'll have less bugs. So that's another way of reducing uh, the risk. Um, again, we, we sort of talked about how. Um, Quality should be everybody's responsibility. Um, so this is, um, I'm, going to talk, I'm going to talk about that some more in a little bit. Uh, but increasing the communication and collaboration between all the different teams. So this is uh, between the developers, the QAs, and, and those kind of things. Um, again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, let me skip through that a bit. So this is kind of an interesting one at the bottom. Um, so what is the... Uh, what is the right level of quality that you, you want to achieve, right? So sometimes um, there's this different sort of things, right? So uh, particularly in an early stages uh, where I'm testing out a feature, uh, maybe I actually don't need a high level of quality, right? I don't need that, that regression suite, right? Um, so that, that, this is kind of like you kind of have to ask the question, and it may change for different aspects of your application, right? So for example, let's think about it. So like, um, like a social feed, right? Okay, we want a high level of quality, but is that the same as the code that calculates taxes, right? Or calculates currency changes? It's probably not, right? Um, if I if I break my Facebook feed, yeah, I'm going to annoy some users. Um, I'll get some posts in my forum, but but if I break if I uh, if I change, if I screw up the way that my taxes are calculated, then uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll get fined. I'll definitely annoy a lot more users. Uh, so, what is what is the right level of quality for the for the features of product? Um, so, getting back to what we were talking about earlier. So, um, this is about the uh, <clears throat> what we recommend um, is cross-functional teams. So, product-focused teams that have uh, have these skills. Um, they don't necessarily have to be people. Um, that they can be skills, right? So I think um, you know a developer can care about QA. Um, a developer can have all automation skills, um, and similarly, a product person um, will often will do a lot of should be doing a lot of, a lot of QA as, as well. So what we recommend is 
is the whole team should, should be um, working together, uh, communicating, sitting um, together, and thinking about quality um, together. So like some of the things we talked about earlier about forcing the, um, not forcing, I think the developer should want this, but um, running the running the test suite before it goes in, uh, the developer actually running the test suite, because um, that's quite a common thing. It's like the, the, the QA suite only runs in a QA environment, it's written by the QAs, and the developers are like, yeah, someone somewhere is writing automated tests, and I, I really don't care. So it's, it's actually about forcing the pain, because uh, for those, uh, for those developers and and then fixing it together, right? So everybody should feel the uh, the pain of it, and, and collaborating and refactoring and uh, fixing those things together. So uh, again, this I'm sorry I'm skipping through this quite fast, but I'm realizing I'm going to overrun really badly. Um, but this is probably a whole talk within itself, and we're happy to uh, arrange that at some point. Um, we talked about this quite um, already uh, a lot. Um, this is this idea that um, the, the way we like to think about code at Fortworks is that everything is a hypothesis, right? So everything, everything that you do, um, like quite often, um, you know, everything is just an idea. So we may have some that, that idea came from somewhere, but often it's just uh, some people sitting in a room coming up with an idea. We don't actually know that it's valuable to a customer, to anyone. We don't know that it's gonna make any money until we put it into production, right? And if it's gonna take three months or six months for us to put it into production uh, and then find out <laughs> that, that um, it actually wasn't very valuable because it was, everything was a hypothesis. We don't know, right? We can do, uh, you know, we can change, we can, try and be more sure about stuff by doing research, by doing user testing, but we don't really know until, until we get it out there, right? Um, but if, you know, if by adding a lot of regression, a lot of QA um, forces you to uh, not, to validate, um, to postpone your validation, uh, then it's kind of going back to the fact that you're costing the company money, okay? Um, that again, this is, I think actually we had a talk about this recently. Um, Jordan Brown's talk was touched on this quite a lot. Um, okay, that's, I just did that, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, this is the big reveal. So am I saying that you don't need to test? <laughs> so no, I'm not saying that, right? I'm saying um, you, like, actually the funny thing about some of this, the companies that are doing continuous delivery, they do a lot of manual testing they do a lot less automated testing than you'd expect. Um, and partly it's because of those changes are very small, they're very isolated in the architecture, and, um, and it's very easy. It's very easy to do the, the testing. So, um, so again, it's, it's kind of like things like, they've done work to, um, it's very easy to, uh, to actually do the test, so it's very easy to find test data. Um, um, when, I, when I say it's very easy, like quite often there's certain things that are really, really difficult to do. So for example, um, I was at a, at a, a client where um, it, it went through like this auction process, but that auction process would, would go over two days. So every time you needed to do a change, you'd have to like, um, you would have to, it would take two days uh, to, to do that auction process. But what we actually did is we built uh, like, a, like a time machine into the system where they could essentially, uh, we stubbed up the clock in the system and you, the, a, a business analyst or a QA could actually uh, go through cycles and they could, uh, you know, the automated test or the manual testers could actually go through and, and test those things. So it's about, so if I am going to do manual testing and I am going to make it part of my, um, my process, uh, you, there are ways of, of making it really, uh, really, uh, really efficient. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things that you should work on. Um, yeah, it's a typo, typo there, but it's um, what I'm, I guess some of the things that it's um, it's, just, it's about useful testing, right? So less about following scripts that you don't really understand what they're doing or the reason for them. Uh, we believe that uh, exploratory testing, you know, should be they should be experts in the product that they're building, right? This is part of the cross-functional teams. They should it shouldn't be what um, we see sort of like. Um, Swarms. So you have sort of testers that are swarms that come in, um, 
but like you, you're only going to get a certain level of testing because you're not um, you're <clears throat> you're not an expert in the product. You weren't involved when the requ requirements came up. So we feel that they uh, everybody in the team, especially the the QA department, should should know about uh, what the product's trying to achieve. Uh, they should know about um, uh, what the users think of the product and those kind of things. So, uh, you know, and it's important to have experts in usability, accessibility, and security. Um, I'm not saying every tester should be an expert in all of those things, but it's important that you are testing for those things. Um, all right, so let's just quickly uh, recap, because I'm about out of time. So, so, so some of the things we talked about, right? So how do, how do we move away from these long-running, flaky, browser-based tests, right? So we're saying push down the pyramid, right? So uh, Unit tests, um, service tests, API tests, look at in-process tests, um, look at sort of component testing, so test your component well, and then test the interaction between components. Um, a decoupled architecture, this is similar. Um, we're saying adopt some of the continuous delivery practices, um, optimize for the recovery. Um, there are other ways of reducing the risk, small releases, small apps, small changes. Testing in production, useful monitoring, uh, avoid the broken windows. Yes, environments. Um, you know, uh, as many environments that are necessary, um, and um, environments that are not broken, that uh, configurations change is uh, applied to automatically. Um, and then quality is everybody's responsibility. Um, and at the end, we talked about some of the um, the idea of experiments, and maybe you should do less testing. Um, if you want to validate your idea uh, sooner. So that's pretty much it, I think. Uh, so that was the end of it. That, I appreciate, was a very broad and uh, um, quite high-level talk. Um, I'm happy to um, take some questions. Um, I'm also, if you'd like to hear about more deeper into some of those topics, um, we're happy to schedule uh, and other sessions where we talk deeper about some of those topics. Um, so uh, there's a board outside uh, where uh, you can write down what you'd like to hear about. Uh, so if you want to hear more deeper about any of those particular topics, please uh, write it down. Cool. So that was it. Um, do we do, you want to talk about this now? Yeah. Then we'll do Q&A. Chris. Yeah, my name's Chris, I work at ThoughtWorks. Uh, real quick, I want to apologize to all the New Zealanders. I think Tim actually does like New Zealand. He actually went on a hike there for two months earlier this year. So, uh, but real quick, an announcement. Um, we have um, an upcoming event in about a, about a little more than a month uh, called Build Your Own Radar. Um, so this is sort of, uh, the Tim mentioned the technology radar that we had earlier. So this is a, the ability to kind of, with your own organization, have like Build Your Own Radar and how to come up with what are the tools and techniques for the context of your company that makes sense. So. Anyway, this is in about a little more than a month, so please join us, and, and we'll be pushing out more materials on this in the website uh, that Tim has linked here. So please uh, go to that site and register and join us for that. If you have any questions on, on, that, on that event, please uh, come talk to me after this. I'm happy to talk more about it. So, thanks. Awesome. All right, so let's. Uh, we're going to do Q and A in just a second. I know it's a little bit later, but like, uh, if if we're, we'll do a few questions, but if none, you want to actually ask personally of Tim, he'll be here for a while. There's other there's other thought workers who can actually answer a lot of these questions as well because we've been doing those. Um, thought workers, raise your hand. Sorry, I'm gonna raise them. Yes, please talk to us about some of these concepts as well. It, we can go much deeper into that. Um, but thank you for coming, and let's go ahead and give one more round of applause for Tim. And any questions? Let's start now. Go ahead. Um, not to not to cast any doubt on what you said, but just for the purpose of doing things like building internal business cases and all these uh, kind of questions, is there any data or any research at all that supports assertions like smaller changes mean less risk, cross-functional teams actually work, or is it just that we happen to have a couple of successful companies who happen to have done pretty well, but we're not really sure why that actually is? <laughs> Um, so, I can tell you that most of uh, most of where we get our experience from um, <clears throat> is from uh, applying these practices. Um, so it's not 
a small amount of companies. It's a, it's a lot of companies. Uh, you know. So Fortworks works has um, four and a half thousand employees, and um, and so so a lot of what I'm talking about has uh, as we've seen um, in practice. Right? I think there's probably a few things that were a bit more advanced um, that is surprising that that has uh, has worked. Um, for certain companies. I think the one thing I might actually say that's kind of interesting is there's probably this probably isn't that many companies that do all of this. Right? I, I kind of I gave you everything, but it's 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 normally um, normally what someone has done is they've chosen some things, but then they've really I think the big the big point is the companies that do it well is they've made a statement about it and it's come from the top. Um, so it's, it's usually a statement um, in the architectural principles, principles of the company um, from the CTO. And uh, so I guess that's probably the common thing is like, so a lot of these things will work um, and all the different, you know, so I'm not saying that, um, yeah, you can, you can build a monolith, you can have lots and lots of uh, automated testing if you apply the infrastructure to it. That's one of the things we talked about earlier, right? Um, and if that's the direction that the company wants to go in, um, then uh, and the company has made a statement and they've applied cash to it, then um, then that works for them, right? And other companies are going, okay, let's do lots and lots of unit tests, lots of testing in production with microservices. But it's, I think it's probably the, the one common thing is a clear direction, um, and then also the clear direction. But then also it's it's um, money and time to back that up, right? So it's kind of like. Um, uh, it's kind of like, I, I, I sometimes feel this thing of like, I don't know if you've noticed this, is um, sometimes some of the stuff that we want to do is not our day job, right? So you, you sort of have to make it your day job, right? So you uh, incentivize people to, uh, for the behaviors that you want, right? So it's like, if, you know, if I believe that, um, you know, the test we should never approach, we should never go beyond 10 minutes, then, I, you know, I'm, I should, you know, I should have that, that statement somewhere, and I should penalize folks if, if it does, right? Or, or provide time and money to fix those problems. Um, so I think, uh, so getting back to your answer, there probably is some research. I'm not very familiar with it. Um, I, the research that I know is from within my company um, that I've worked with for 10 years, and most of it's just from uh, applying these practices and seeing um, changing, doing digital transformation, transformation with these companies. Um, but I will try, it would be interesting to see if there's more scientific and academic research, for sure. All right, any more questions? Yes? You mentioned that most of the tests we should run before the developer checks in. So does that mean uh, I'm human some kind of uh, hooks before check-in, or basically merging to your release branches or things like that? Uh, Um, yeah, so um, I've, I've seen it done in different ways. Um, so uh, I can talk about a few different ways. Um, one way is you could run, you could, you could set up the, 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 the browser-based tester that they run on your, um, they run on your computer. Um, so you can actually you run the Selenium server on your computer. That's one way. Obviously, at a certain point, your laptop only has a certain amount of power. Um, other ways I've seen it done is uh, there's actually a company that we're working with that um, allows a uh, allows a developer to um, it's just a command. That, that, that what it does it just copies all the code. It doesn't really matter whether it's in a branch or wherever. It just copies it onto a server somewhere and then runs all the tests on it and then reports back. Um, that's one example. What is the trigger for that? Um, so it, it's it's it, this is all about trust uh, of the developer. So um, it would be a command. The it's it, it's up to the developer to do it, right? Okay. So they would. Uh, uh, I've also seen uh, at uh, quite often um, uh, for Forex projects, we often build like a CLI. So like uh, yeah, you could use a, a GitHub post hook, but also also like a CLI that enforces certain practices um, that you. Uh, so for example, this company that's that's doing that. So it. it it's, it's a lot of um, trust on the developer, right? Because um, the developer is expected to have run the test recently, 
but actually in the deployment pipeline, there's a check that says, when's the last time this developer ran? Um, but it's not, it's not a strict thing. It's not saying, like, did it actually run with the latest code? But there's a sort of a, a little bit of, uh, of check there. Um, all right, any more questions? Okay. Cool. I think we're good then. Thanks.